Yeah, well, let's see if this works. Thank you for having me. It's a, is this too loud? That's about right. Uh, it's terrific to be here. Uh, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about today. I have uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time studying the history of invention in the uh, information industries, you know, media industries, computer industries, so forth. And I guess I want to say that most of those inventions have two things in common. Basically, they're all hacks, number one. And number two, most of them, but all of them, involve breaking the law somehow. So if you look at the history of invention in the 20th, the last 120 years, of the major things that we think of as important to our information environment today, whether it's television, whether it's the radio, broadcasting, whatever it is. Um, this thing is making me a little nervous here. <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> no, fortunately, bigamy is permitted, not permitted in this country. But, and anyways, most legal, most of the important inventions, information involve two things. I said it before. Number one, they're hacks. Number two, they often, not always, involve breaking the law somehow. And in fact, more generally, that's often how things change. The way things actually change is a, in, in fundamental ways tends to be some combination of those two things. And I can talk about that later. But let's, let's go through my examples. I have about five of them. I'm going to start with the telephone, which is sort of the, the, um, the invention that starts the many of the things we're still interested in today. And there's a couple interesting things around the invention of the telephone that I want to point out to you. One of them is the fact that uh, Alexander Graham Bell himself was actually not a great electrician. He had a very poor understanding of some of the principles of electricity that were thought to be the time. His actual profession, if you know anything about the history, is he was a, a teacher of the deaf. And so he had a very acute understanding of sound, but a very poor understanding of electricity. And as the fact that in the, in the stories and the history of invention, it's often people who don't really understand things too well who invent things in a strange way because by not understanding current thought that deeply, sometimes you're able to make jump fo jumps forward that other people are cognitively limited in making. So I'm saying if you're really at the cutting edge of your law is a great example. Often law professors make some of their most interesting points right when they start writing. And it's because they don't actually understand their field that well yet. They, they're not <laughs> deeply in the debate. They don't know what the finer points are. They just come to it and they see things. That's often true with invention too. So Alexander Graham Bell, he didn't understand electricity all that well, so he didn't realize what everyone had agreed, which is that you couldn't put, you couldn't use electricity to carry sound. Everyone had agreed on that principle. It was, it was settled. And because he didn't know that, he was able to do it, number one. Number two is one of the reasons um, if, if you look at the history of the telephone, there's this uh, uh, kind of, there's this moment where he, Bell invents the, the telephone. There's a little bit of a pause. And then Western Union realizes this thing is actually worth money, the, the incumbent monopolist. And so they hire someone, namely Thomas Edison, to invent their own version of the telephone, which is way better, and he does it you know, in a week or something. So it's not actually that hard at the time to do it. Te technology is at the point where it can be done. If you give a talented person money and resources, but what the advantage that Bell had over everyone else is that everyone else was trying to improve the telegraph at the time. Everyone else was absolutely focused on the idea that the way to make money, the pot of gold, was going to be for whoever created the better telegraph. And their big idea at the time is they wanted to create a telegraph that go to the home, which actually is a good idea because that's basically email or, or, or text messaging or something. But they thought that is where it's going, and this voice stuff is just going nowhere. It's a, kind of a toy. It's for fun. It's not a serious invention. So that fact that everybody's trying to do something else is actually a huge advantage. And that's basically often what hackers are doing, is they're moving in a slightly different direction than everything, everyone else because they see something that other people don't. They're not watching what people are doing. They're watching what nature is telling them. And nature was telling Bell you can actually carry voice on a wire. 
So that's number one. Technology number two I'm going to talk about is broadcasting. Um, broadcasting, radio, television, broadcasting ended up being, I mean, it goes without saying, one of the most powerful forces in the 20th century. Launched armies, propaganda campaigns, NBC, CBS, obviously something, uh, it, it really is the mass media. But who invented broadcasting? What's interesting is nobody really knows. Or no one has quite a, there's people who claim to have invented broadcasting, but uh, mostly based on fabricated uh, documents. And when you go through the history and you think about the major inventions and you realize that you don't know who invented it, it usually means there was somebody who got co-opted by somebody else. It usually means there was some kind of relatively minor hacker, usually a teenager or something, who came up with this thing and has been completely forgotten. The only time you remember when someone invented something is when they then have a company that bears their name. So everyone knows who invented the light bulb because we have General Electric, and, and Edis, which is Edison's company still. Everyone knows who invented the telephone because Bell is still around. Um, the inventions that people don't know who invented usually are the fact, result from low-key low unknown hackers who came up with something. And that is exactly what happened with broadcast radio. Radio in the 19th century, brilliant invention, but it was firmly understood that the point of radio was point-to-point -point communications ship-to-ship -ship communications in particular. And for so that reason, terrestrial radio was severely limited based on the idea that it might interfere with ship-to-ship -ship communications and create trouble. So there was very limited purpose you could put radio to. And it, so it took people who had no stake in the game, who were not really interested in things, to start using radio for a different purpose, which was namely for one pe person to reach many people. Broadcasting. Which, if you look in a dictionary from the 19th century, is still defined as a seeding technique. You throw seeds out, as opposed to narrow casting, where I guess you put them in little spots. I don't know. Um, and so it was people, and actually, I don't think anyone has completely, conclusively figured out when the first radio broadcast was. It could have been as early as 1909. There was a radio station operating in New York in the 1910s which claimed as many as a thousand listeners. But the fact is that there were things happening in this area at least 20 or 30 years before CBS and NBC became part of it, and before radio became a mass technology. Let me talk about another similar one. No, actually a different one, chronologically. The next is the history of film. First of all, I want to point out that like some of these others, very few people in this room probably know who invented the film projector and the movie camera. You know, important industry, huge industry, but who actually invented movies? Again, it's a story of basically someone getting shafted, which is <laughs> a guy named Carl Jenkins. He, he did okay. He invented some other stuff. He invented the, the cone, that, the cone cups that hold water, and that's where he made it. You know those cone cups? That, you, <laughs> that was his profitable invention. His uh, invention of the movie projector didn't go well. And in fact, I think he said once, I can't remember how he put it, he said the inventor uh, knows to himself that he has the glory, but he sees none of it in his own life, or something like that. He has a very sad kind of thing. Um, anyway, this guy invented, uh, he and also French, there was also a, a simultaneous French invention of, of, of the movie theater. But we'll skip ahead a little bit and talk about the 1910s. 1910s, um, about 1909 or so, film was dominated by a trust um, that had a collection of patents over most of the important film technologies, known as the Edison Trust, and it was headed by uh, the Thomas Edison's film company. And this group had very clear ideas about what film was and what it would be as an industry. And their rules were like this. Basically, the ideal length for a film was 10 minutes long. 20 minutes long was allowed in exceptional uh, circumstances. Plots were to be relatively simple, not involved anything that might be remotely controversial. For example, they, someone made a film that involved a burglary of a house, and the film trust decided in the future they should avoid that kind of thing because it would encourage criminal behavior. Um, 
actors and actresses were not allowed to be credited. And the idea was that if you credit actors or actresses, they would begin to ask for more money. And so to keep prices down, it was important that actors and actresses not be credited. So you had all these rules for film, no controversial films, obviously no political films, nothing going on. And there were a bunch of people who started to think, mostly exhibitors, that we can do better. You know, we can make more interesting films. Their big idea basically was to copy European film, French film, mainly, because uh, the French had invented this thing called the feature film, which is to say a film with a plot, you know, the film we consider a film today, a feature film. Plot, characters, dialogue, um, uh, famous actors, and so forth. And they had this idea, and these guys were interesting guys. They were all from the Lower East Side, I think one or two from Boston, but almost all of them from the Lower East Side, almost all of them immigrants. And they said, we can do this differently. Basically, they didn't say it this way, but they thought, we can hack the film system. All right, we're going to make our own films ourselves, and we're going to make them good. We know what people want to see, even though we have all these rules. But the main th problem with that idea was that everything they were doing was a violation of the patent law. Because they, in order to do this, had to break out from the trust and had to break every one of the trust's rules, and therefore had to operate without the licenses to all the patented technologies. And so they were sued. I think Carl Lamely, founder of Universals, was sued 183 times in one year. Fox, the founder of 20th Century Fox, was hounded almost out of existence. He was accused by the film studios of running a prostitution, prostitution ring. He was imprisoned. He wasn't in prison for long, but he was put into prison at one point. Um, so these guys were chased around by the dominant media industry of the time, which was Edison Trust. And eventually it got so bad, and there are a lot of explanations why I did this, eventually it went to the West Coast, a number of reasons for doing that, a little further away from, from New York patent suits and so forth. And that's where they went to Hollywood, started this idea of Hollywood. So Hollywood was started by a bunch of hackers who hated the current media industry, who thought the current media industry was oppressive, censorial, and made bad movies. And so they made their own. Later on, they became big and started their own cartel. But at the very beginning, it's important to understand that Hollywood began as a hacker enterprise. Next story is cable television. Cable is another one of those technologies which probably many people in this room use, but have no idea who invented it. Even though it has this, maybe you think Ted Turner invented it or something. He did invent some important stuff. I'll give him some credit. Um, again, it was like a very small time operation. It was people who lived in the mountains, or the hills of Pennsylvania, who were unable to re receive signals. And so, most of the stories you read are about people who own electronic stops, something like that. They put up tall towers, grab signals, and they're able to send it around. It's an enormous industry again, and it leads back to the point about law. The first, what happened within 10 years of cable television's invention is they were subject to deck clearing copyright lawsuits and began a 30-year legal campaign where the, cop, where the broadcast industry, which I said itself was begun by hackers, but nonetheless, broadcast industry tried to sue the cable industry out of existence. And I guess uh, at some point the cable industry won. Comcast buying NBC can be seen as a sort of revenge <laughs> for years and years of torment by the broadcast industry, who considered cable to be sort of low class, you know, um, they weren't, uh, okay, it wasn't invented in a laboratory at MIT or, or somewhere fancy. Uh, it was basically rural, they wouldn't call themselves hacker, like electron, electrician tinkerer types invented cable. And it goes on, and some of the more, uh, I'll now conclude with the examples you're probably more familiar with, which are um, computer networking and computers. Um, I think by now everyone knows that Steve Wozniak, who was one of, who was sort of the motive force between the original Apple computer, um, that he and Steve Jobs had a project before the Apple I computer. Their original collaboration was a way of making phone calls for free on the AT&T network, uh, known as a blue box. This was their first invention, and it worked. They figured out how to pack the network and uh, make free phone calls. And I think that resistance to what was going on at the time, you see very 
deeply expressed in the, in the early days of Apple. I mean, they kind of tried to keep that image going later. But this, this idea among the early computer people that they were reacting to the fact that computers were all in these enormous centralized institutions, the Defense Department, major universities, huge companies, that's where computers were. When you think about what Steve Wozniak did when he created a computer that could be sold for $1,000 or $2,000, it was a massive decentralization of computing power from the center to the people. And so there's a very intense ideology in some ways, a very powerful set of ideas embodied in the invention of com personal computing. And I'll add to that the invention, or much of the invention of networking, well, usually the story you'll read, and it's an important story, is about the founders of the internet and Vint Cerf and other people who I will give a lot of credit to. It is also a fact that I do not know if the internet would have reached anyone if you didn't have in the 1980s and, and 1990s the concurrent rise of basic computer networking, much of which was amateurs like myself as a teenager who were operating modems, and most this is another one of these histories that is very little attention, but the spread of widespread amateur computer networking through modems, BBSs, and all this kind of stuff, usually with the purpose of trying to get software for free. <laughs> Not always, sometimes to have discussions about issues of the day. So that's basically it. I, I, I think the, the case sort of speaks for itself. I don't want to say there hasn't been inventions that have happened in industrial laboratories, or MIT and, and Stanford and places like that. There have been important things. Often they tend to be more of the nature of incremental, improving innovations. You know, they do something and it gets better. IBM invented the mainframe, or and a lot of computing, and then they would improve it, and improve it, and improve it. And that's an important role of innovation. I don't want to deny it. But there's also a lot of stuff that started with very humble, out of the way, total outsiders, often who were forced to break the law. Now, we could say forced. They just kind of were oblivious to the law, usually. Sometimes they had to, like in the example of Hollywood. Now, why is it that we see so many of these important inventions come from these unlikely sources? Well, I think it's what I said earlier. It's very difficult to be aware or to think about what you're not thinking about. You know, you're, we're all of us in this room are highly limited in our cognitive horizons. You know, when you think of a good startup, you probably think, well, Facebook was good, so maybe I'll add a couple features. Maybe I'll have some circles, put my friends in or something. You know, you do this little, <laughs> little step. <laughs> You're like, okay, that's gonna be much better or something like that. And you know, sometimes these are important steps. But when you're kind of locked into trying to do what people are doing now, because you're so into it, you're so close to it, it's difficult to see the things will send things in a very different direction. It's also very frustrating to try and go in a different direction. That's why in what, back in the Bell days, the reason people were trying to invent the telegram as opposed to the telephone is there was a market for it. And very few things cloud the mind as much as the prospect of enormous bundles of cash. You know, if you think that this is where the money is, that is where people will direct their efforts. Of course, why would you do anything else? But the fact is that some of the most innovative stuff, some of the stuff that comes in a completely different direction, historically has come from a very kind of different motive. And I will close by talking about that. I know many people have read works talking about this, but most of the hackers I write about, and I think those of you who are interested in this know this already, the, the motivation the most powerful motivation is one that doesn't demand any external reward. You know, in other words, it's called fun. That is the most powerful motivation because if you do something and you think it's fun, then in some ways nothing can stop you. Because people say, well, you're not getting paid for that. Well, but I'm having fun. Well, you're not going to become famous, to me, but I'm having fun. Who cares about being famous or having money if you're actually having fun? You, you are at a higher space than any of the rest of it, right? So that is sort of the ultimate defense. And if I think that is what is the most powerful form of motivation. Thank you very much.
have a couple, you know, about maybe seven years ago, I ran a conference in DC called Freedom to Connect. It still runs. It's the first time I ever used a back channel like this. And the, the first question up was the one, uh, uh, Tim, will you marry me? Which is a nice bookend for me because the first time we did it, we had Rick Boucher give the keynote. Rick Boucher at the time was either the ranking member or the chair of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on the Internet and Telecommunications. And he had just married a former intern of his. And all that was on the back channel were pictures of him kissing his young intern, now wife. So I like to think this is a good, a good growth experience. It's very positive. Tim, by the way, is married, yes. Uh, uh, any case, uh, we have a couple of good questions. And one thing I want to say is there is something to be said, and I think Tim makes this very clear. We've got to become the sort of lawyer that is an enabler and not a naysayer. And I learned this the hard way. I was a lawyer for a company uh, called Free World Dial-Up. Has anyone, has anyone heard of Free World Dial-Up? A few of you, yeah. So I was the naysayer, the yeah but lawyer for Free World Dial-Up. Free World Dial-Up was essentially Skype before Skype was Skype. It goes back 10 years, it was one of the first global peer-to-peer -peer networks that was allowing voice communications with very squeaky codecs, but it was a way for people around the world to speak for free over the open internet. And we wanted to deploy it as a real bona fide service. We were afraid that we were going to be regulated like a telecom company. So what did we do? What did the lawyer tell them to do? The lawyer said, well, let's petition the FCC to get a declaratory ruling from the FCC that voice communications that traverse the public, uh, uh, th th that traverse the, the public internet should not be treated like telecom services. I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. It took us about a year and a half, which is lightning speed in FCC time, but in the process, Skype built its network, built out its user base, built a community, and was uh, uh, running a network much bigger than ours by the time that the uh, FCC said that, yes, in fact, free will dial up and other similar services are not telecom services subject to telecom regulation. So we're at a meeting in uh, Draper Fisher in California, and Tim Draper walks in and shakes uh, uh, my client's hand and says, thanks a lot, and leaves the room. And his colleagues say, uh, do you know why Tim Draper just came and shook your hand? And we go, no. And he says, you just made him $600 million. He was one of the first investors in Skype. eBay bought Skype, $2.6 billion. He made a nice bundle. Free will dial up, still worth nothing. <laughs> so the lesson is, where the law is murky, innovators and entrepreneurs are going to go for it, and the lawyers have to figure out how to enable them and not to stifle them, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, but, but guide them properly, yeah. Uh, can I take it? I won't make my questions, but maybe I'll use a question on your back channel, which is this question right here. Um, and you should, if, you know, I, I, it's always hard to be up against lunch when people are hungry, but uh, will, law able to, will law ever be able to keep pace with technology? So I question the question. In other words, there really depends what you mean by law and keeping pace with. First, is it actually our aspiration that law keep pace with technology? Now, I would say no. Why do we want, uh, uh, is it just out of, uh, because we want law to be fast for some abstract reason, the same way you, you know, it's kind of like asking, well, will mountain climbers be able to keep pace with jet engines? I mean, no, but we don't want them to. Law isn't, I don't think, meant to be something that is fast. Uh, it's supposed to be a cod. It's it's slow. It's something that's. It's law is about the authorized use of force. So I think you want to think a lot before law actually acts. I don't think it necessarily is something you want to react quickly. I mean, law in ter in totalitarian countries goes very quickly, <laughs> right? People. You, so I, I don't think you actually want law to be fast. And whether it keeps pace with technology, I don't think its job is to keep pace with technology. I think its job is to try, it has a number of jobs, including you know, putting people in jail who are criminals and um, cause uh, enormous damage to other people or, or um, protecting our rights and the Constitution. A lot of, I mean, this is sort of not a t time to reiterate all of what law does, but I think in the technology sector, what law can do is to keep a certain space for innovation that otherwise might be hampered by overly concentrated private power. This is my, my antitrust side. 
Um, I think, for example, the antitrust case against Microsoft, well, maybe not perfect, was ultimately successful as an exercise in law. And why? Because I, I'll take you back to the year 2000 when uh, Microsoft Explorer gained about, I think, 87% market share and finally defeated Netscape. So imagine that point that Microsoft had complete and unsupervised authority over the internet browser for the last 12 years. So Microsoft does whatever it wants with no oversight over the browser. How do any of the internet companies get started when they're, final, when they're susceptible at some level to Microsoft's veto? They would have all ended up exactly, I would predict, where all the applications like WordPerfect and Lotus123 ended up in the 1990s. That is, in a game they cannot win. In a game, a sucker's game, frankly. So, you know, they might have, for example, tolerated Google for a while, but then when push came to shove, given the advantage to Microsoft Search in fundamental ways by, you know, by whatever they could do with an unsupervised browser. So I don't want to go into that, that complete case, but I think it's important to understand that what law does is restrain power. At its best, and particularly in American tradition, law's greatest effort is to restrain excessive use of power, not to aid it. So uh, actually, I want to follow up on that, if I can, for a sec. So there's a dilemma, and I want to ask your advice on the potential for solution for a lot of the folks in this room. If the goal is for the law, I guess the question is, what is the role for these folks to become innate? If the law is reactive, you're describing a scenario in which the law is reactive. Folks are moving ahead with their concepts, and lawyers are perhaps years later reacting to it. We've got folks in this room who have been to hackathons, stepped their toe in the sandbox, and wanted to play in the sandbox. But they see these revolutionaries, these radicals out there doing amazingly new things. What role can these folks serve to become enablers and you know, proactive enablers of new technology as opposed to reacting after the fact? What role is there for the next generation of lawyer to be a proactive ally in transforming society rather than just saying, you know, here it is, you've gone too far, this is the line, we are gonna stop you. I mean, I, uh, if you ever, I use a football analogy following with my all-American theme, which is to say, <laughs> you know, when you watch a, a, when you watch a running back uh, run like 60 yards or something for a touchdown, mostly the camera is on the running back. But of course, that never happens without the blockers. And I think, and, and, and basketball takes the same thing. And I think in many cases, the lawyers can run an important level of resistance while the running back carries the football down the, the field. And maybe that's not as glamorous as actually holding the football, but you yeah, also don't get tackled. They want to build platforms. They want to build, the so democracy's got a platform. Uh -huh. Democracy has a platform that allows crowdsourcing of legal documents. Right. Uh, other companies want to do all sorts of other, build platforms, but you need legal support. You need people with legal training to recognize how the law intersects with the potential platform. Right. And not just be an ACER, but help to build the platform, build, build the structure to enable. Right. Well, look, I, I think that's possible. If you look at the civil rights movement, obviously it was headed by lawyers. Think about the American Revolution, it was headed by lawyers. So I, I don't want to say lawyers are, you know, um, and, and my comments earlier might have reflect the fact I've been in, in, in antitrust, I've been working on antitrust the last couple of years, which is inherently much more reactive. But yes, lawyers can definitely be at the spearhead of things, and I think they do that, I mean, I don't know if I could suggest exactly what they have to do, but I think they do that when they use the power of uh, law's ability to come up with ideas like what is our rights, what the con lawyers are very good at, at distilling concepts in ways that have a lot of power. You know, someone came up with the word right at some point. I have a right to something or other. You know, that didn't that word didn't exist 500 years ago or something. And this is a sort of a legal invention. And then it ends up doing things like upending slavery and and. Uh, certain forms of racial discrimination. So I, I know I'm not being very particular, but I, I feel like lawyers have this incredible, the important role when they um, give shape and form to concepts that then go on and do a lot of work in good. the world. All right, that's good to hear, because this is what we are gonna be struggling with. We, I told you, we're taking the training wheels off, and I feel like too many of the lawyers who wanna get involved in this world abandon the law and become entrepreneurs. 
how do they stay lawyers and still serve a function, a transformative function? And I think that's a great segue into the Hack the Act overview with Docracy. And who is Warren here? Warren? Warren. All right, so a big round of applause for Tim.